Hello, everybody. Thank you for joining us. Uh, this is Open GovCon, and another really, really exciting talk. So this time, we're joined by John, you know, the father of Zero Trust. Uh, we have Hani, you know, one of the key folks at Google, thinking through Zero Trust methodology, and uh, Jonathan thinking through, uh, again, key contributor for Zero Trust from LSA supporting AFRL. And they have a powerful topic here of, you know, how do we even get to step one, and where do we go from there? Gentlemen. Thank you. Hey, why don't I stand here and you push slides, and then I'll flip it for you. So hi, everyone. Thanks for having us. My name is John Kindervog. I'm uh, uh, the creator of Zero Trust. I did that when I was at Forrester. I'm with Jonathan, Hani. We work together uh, on Cloud Security Alliance stuff and, and doing some stuff for the Air Force. So um, let's, uh, let's go into uh, a quick introduction to Zero Trust so that we can set the baseline of what Zero Trust really is, and that way you can, you can um, move forward. So this was the original Zero Trust report. I was at Forrester for eight and a half years, vice president and principal analyst over there. Then I went over to Palo Alto Networks for four years as the field CTO. And now I'm at a company called Ontoit doing managed services for Zero Trust environments around the world. And this was the original report um, called No More Chewy Centers. And, and it, it didn't really set the world on fire. In fact, the first speech that I ever gave was probably maybe this many people in it. And people came up to me and said, man, you're insane. This is a stupid idea. And they would come up and insult me and all that kind of stuff. But I'd done two years of primary research when I was at Forrester, so I knew it worked. And so then, that's where it started, and here's where we are now. So uh, in 2021, the President of the United States issued an executive order where he said that uh, all federal government agencies must adopt security best practices and advance towards a zero trust architecture. So in 2010, if you would have told me that 11 years later, the President of the United States was gonna issue an executive order mandating a move towards zero trust, I would have told you, get back in your DeLorean, turn on that flux capacitor, get that thing up to 88 miles an hour and go back to Hill City because it will never happen, but it did. And that's the crazy story. And what, what happened with this is uh, the President of the United States changed the incentive structure around zero trust globally. So a lot of us early on, I would try to get people to, uh, hey, will you do a session with me on zero trust, like what we're doing now? No one would do it. They would want to do it, like I, if I talked to Jonathan, yeah, I'd love to do that. Let me go get permission from my PR team or whatever. And they'd say, no, that'll put a target on our back. We can't tell anybody we, we're doing zero trust. So we used to joke that zero trust was like Fight Club, right? The first rule is you don't talk about it. And what changed is the President of the United States changed the Fight Club rules. And now you talk about it. You talk about it all the time. So last week, I was four days in Washington, D.C., uh, International Monetary Fund, I did ATARC, if you're familiar with the ATARC conference. I did uh, State Ramp, which is the CISOs from states all over the United States, and then I did State Department. Everybody's talking about it. So that's what the value of this executive order, beyond the stuff that's tactically happening, but the changing of the incentivization so that you can say, oh, it's okay to do this, it's okay to think this way. Next slide. So what is zero trust? Here is the concise, authoritative de uh, um, definition from the person who created it, right? From the horses, whatever. I'm the horse, you can decide which end of the horse I am later on, okay? But uh, zero trust is a strategy, a strategy designed to stop data breaches. Now what's data? Data is the new oil, right? Data is the thing that fuels modern economies. Now I'm from Texas, and where we pump oil out of the ground, and oil, the more you refine it, the more valuable it gets, right? So you have uh, gasoline, you know, raw crude oil, then you have gasoline, you have aviation fuel, jet fuel, plastics, carbon fiber, nanotubes, all that stuff make it more valuable. Same with data, the more it's refined, the more valuable it is. If they just have my name, nah, no big deal, right? That used to be in the phone book. Who here remembers the phone book, right? I was, I was talking about phone books uh, one time and, and somebody who's a much younger person than I am said, hold it. What's a phone book? And I said, uh, I explained what a phone book was. And she said to me, get out of town. You guys actually published PII? I'm like, yeah, yeah, that's what we did back then, yeah. The new phone books are here. The new phone books are here. I am somebody. Name the movie. The Jerk. Come on, Navin Johnson. Somebody 
no, you're not all that young. Oh, man. Oh, just, uh. Okay, anyway. So, no, 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 we haven't finished it, Jonathan. So we, we, it's designed to stop data breaches. Now, what's a breach? A breach, we used to say a breach is somebody got into our castle walls and they're poking around. But legal and regulatory entities like GDPR, C CCPA, PCI have redefined what a breach is for us. And now a breach is when sensitive, or regulated data is exfiltrated, goes outbound from our networks of systems into the hands of malicious systems. So it's not about what's going coming in. That's still important, but what's even more important is what's going out. And so a data breach, we want to stop data breaches because that's the only thing that IT can do to get the CEO fired, okay? To get a leader fired. And the other thing Zero Trust can do is make cyber attacks unsuccessful. And it does that by eliminating trust from digital systems, right? We're talking about digital systems, zero trust, getting rid of digital systems. So there are two kinds of cyber attacks, successful and unsuccessful. Now in our, our practice last year, we had our first successful ransomware attack and we'd stopped thousands upon thousands of ransomware attacks because you, you cannot s stop the attack from starting because then you have to be the attacker, right? but you can make this attack unsuccessful. So that's what you're trying to do with Zero Trust. And we had a successful um, uh, uh, ransomware attack and we contained it very quickly, but it was very embarrassing. And we had to call the CISO and say, hey, you know, this is what happened. We contained it, but you know, we're sorry, we, we're, we're investigating it. And he said, oh, that is the best news I've heard in a long time. Thank you so much. This is great news. And like, how is a ransomware attack great news? That makes no sense. And he said, oh, you don't understand. This is the company that we just acquired and they've refused to adopt our zero trust best practices. So now I can go to the CEO and force them to do the thing we've been trying to cajole them to do in the past. So that's the value of that. So we're just gonna get rid of trust from digital systems. Next slide. So let's look at some misconceptions. The first one is zero trust makes a system trusted. That's false. How much trust should there be in a system called zero trust? Zero! I tried to be very explicit about that, but we have these terms explicit trust, implicit trust, and then if you do this thing, then it's trusted and blah, 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 blah. We're trying to eliminate the trust model. That's the fundamental problem, this broken trust model. Next, zero trust is about identity. You'll hear that from vendors all the time. Zero trust consumes identity and policy. Right? We'll talk about that in a little bit and you'll see some demonstrations of that. And then there are zero trust products. You've all had a vendor come up to you and say, hey, if you buy our stuff, you'll be all zero trusty, right? No, there are products that work well in, a, in your zero trust environment based upon what you are trying to protect. And then finally, zero trust is complicated. There's really only nine things that you need to know. There's a there's four design principles and a five-step model of how you do it. And once you understand that, you will see how simple it is to get started in zero trust. Next one. So trust is a hard thing to define. But will you agree with me that trust is a human emotion? It's a human emotion, right? And it's been injected into digital systems for no reason at all. We don't know when that happened, but it becomes then a vulnerability. And what do you do with vulnerabilities in your organization? You mitigate them. So you have to mitigate trust because trust is not only a vulnerability, it is also an exploit at the same time. In fact, it's the only vulnerability. And I was trying to get uh, Greg, uh, General Tuhill, Greg, to for April Fools, we were trying to get a CVE done for trust as a joke, but uh, there was some pushback over there uh, at CERT, you know, the, the, the What's that? Right, right. Well, let's just say some other people. Greg thought it was great fun, but then uh, anyway, so uh, he, he works for Carnegie Mellon and, and we have some common friends. Anyway, so trust is a vote. You're getting ahead of me there. Uh, that, that is also an exploit. And so therefore the only entity who gets value from trust in your organization are the malicious actors who are going to exploit it. Think about that. It provides you no value, so why would you even want it? Yeah, this is dwell time right here. The malicious actors ha hanging out in your environment and you don't know it. Why do we have dwell time? Because we have a broken trust model. Next. So if we look at this broken trust model more, the untrusted side went to the evil internet 
and you can build that out. Uh, and the trusted side went to your network, where all the good people are. And everybody who works for you, they come to work on rainbow unicorns, don't they? Handing out candy to little boys and girls on the way. They're wonderful people. They would never do anything wrong. But look, what happens if malware crosses that ephemeral trust boundary? And you can put it on the right side of that, that green circle. Well, what's, what's malware? Malware is just a collection of packets. What's a packet? A packet is a bunch of zeros and ones is represented by electrons or photons. So if I can get an electron that I control onto your CAT6 cable on the right side of that diagram, you're gonna give that electron elevated privileges and attributes of trust, right? Zeros and ones, photons and electrons. That's in our, our entire business right there, in a nutshell. And so we gotta get rid of that paradigm because suddenly at that point they become a malicious insider. And so there's a couple of malicious insiders that are so famous, I call them the Beyonce and the Rihanna of cybersecurity. They're one word people. Snowden, Manning, you know those names, right? They were trusted users on trusted devices, right? They had, um, they, they had the right endpoint protection. They had the right patch levels. Uh, they had robust identity systems. They had powerful multi-factor authentication and they had least privileges too, yes, right. No, they didn't. Uh, and yet nobody looked at their packets post-authentication. This is why identity is consumed in zero trust. This is why MFA and identity systems are not equivalent to zero trust. They're part of how we build out zero trust. Because ultimately, every data breach is an exploitation of the trust model because every data breach makes the malicious uh, activity part of, of the inside, they, they become a malicious insider. Next. So we got to get rid of trust. No more trusted packets, no more trusted users, no more trusted systems, no more trusted devices. Now people will object to that and they'll say, John, you're saying people aren't trustworthy. Right, I, everybody has to throw a joke at, well, I'm not sure I trust you. Uh, that, that, so I've just done it for you so you don't have to do it after the thing is over. Uh, and I'm not saying that people are untrustworthy. I'm saying something much more profound. I am saying people are not packets. People are not packets. It is the anthropomorphization of the network that's killing us. The idea that John is on the network. Well, I've never been on a network before. I've never shrunken down into a subatomic particle where I've been sent over the public internet to say a Zoom server or wherever. This never happened to me. It's never happened to you. None of you have ever been on a network. Right? It only happens in the movies. Tron, Lawnmower Man, Wreck-It Ralph. But even in the Matrix, they gotta plug in, don't they? So we have to get rid of that anthropomorphization and realize that it's just a user, is, their identity is asserted to be generating the packets from a device. And then we look at those packets and say, are they doing what they're supposed to be doing? Should they have access to the right, that resource? Are they behaving in a way that is, is peculiar? Next. So there's four design concepts in Zero Trust. The first one is we want to focus on the business outcomes. You must understand what your leadership is trying to accomplish, right? We don't do this because it's fun. We do this to drive a business or to drive, you know, if we work for a government, the Air Force, I mean, there's a mission involved in it, right? So we must focus on that. That's the first step. The second step is that we design from the inside out instead of the outside in. How many people have ever gotten like a CCNA, CCDA, any kind of that certification, right? How did you learn to design the networks? You started at the edge, didn't you? You started at the CPE equipment. You started at, um, you know, you had to get the right handoff and put the right WAN card into the router because back when I started, you couldn't get a, a, an ethernet handoff, right? You'd get X25 or you'd get uh, T, T1 or whatever it was, ISDN, all kinds of crazy stuff. And so you, then you would design it, you build out the, the, the core switching, the, the distribution switching, right, which I know is called spine and leaf now, which I think is crazy. Like pick a tree metaphor or a human body metaphor and go with it, but don't confuse the two of them. But anyway, that's what happens when you allow engineers to do marketing, right? Uh, and, and so once you, 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 you built that, then you just let the business plug into wherever they wanted to go. And then the third thing is determine who or what needs to have access, needs to know least privilege. Hani made a joke about least privilege. 
Both Snowden and Manning had access to everything on that super secret secure network because they had authenticated into it. There wasn't actually least privilege. No one knew what they were doing. Uh, Snowden, PFC Snowden, went to the NSA person at the forward operating base in Iraq and asked, hey, are you looking for malicious activity on the internal network? And the NSA person who was in charge of that network says, no, we only look for malicious activity coming in from the outside. Crazy, right? What was the, what was the attack vector? The trust model for both of those. And then the fourth step is we inspect and log all traffic all the way up to layer seven. Why do we do it at layer seven? Because that's where the attackers live. Why would we do it lower in the stack? And it's one of the things, a lot of people who, who didn't live through what people in my generation lived through, which is, excuse me, the proliferation of more and more uh, sophisticated attacks, don't realize how, how, uh, how much of a step it was when we started to get layer seven visibility into what was happening. And so we do this so that we can instantiate zero trust as a policy. Uh, next slide. That's what zero trust is. It's a layer seven policy statement. We just have to have some layer seven controls to enforce the policy. Okay. And then finally, or not finally, but there's a five-step model, right? So we had the four design principles. Now we have the five steps of how you deploy it. So the first thing you're going to do is define the protect surface. What do you need to protect, right? And the answer is we protect what's known as a DAS element. So DAS is an acronym uh, that... It's, oh, I guess I took that out. I must have taken that out of the slide. Uh, an acronym that stands for data, applications, assets, or services. So anything of one of those four things that are sensitive is generally what I say you should protect. And so you take a single DAS element, put it into a single protect surface, and you build out your protect surface, or you build out your zero trust environment one protect surface at a time. This makes zero trust three things. Incremental, you're doing it one at a time. Iterative, you're doing it one after another and non-disruptive. All you can screw up is one protect surface. Too many people try to do it all at once for their entire organization. And it's too big. You cannot eat the elephant with one bite, right? You eat it one bite at a time. You don't swallow the elephant whole. I don't know, I've never ate an elephant, but that's, we all know that that's, that's the same. And then we map the transaction flows. Why do we do this? We need to understand how the system works together as a system so that we can know where to put the controls. And that's the third step, uh, architect the environment. Usually people back in my day, we started with a big reference architecture and we built a network. And then we said to the business, plug in wherever you want. And they said, well, that's wonderful. You've given me this network with a bunch of round holes, but I have square pegs. What do I do? And we say, well, the vendor gave us a free whittling knife. So you whittle it down and make it fit to what we built for you. And that's actually how the cloud started. Because the, the business said, well, no, I'm I got a credit card. I'm gonna go to the cloud. And so we would talk about, we'd be, get frustrated, you know, we talk about rogue IT or shadow IT. Well, why did that happen? Because we were creating things that didn't fit the needs of the business. And so we're gonna architect the zero trust environment based upon the protect surface. Every zero trust environment is tailor-made for the thing that it's protecting. Right? You can't just ubiquitously say, I'm going to do it all this way and then fit it in later on. It does not work that way. You look at what you're protecting and you build out from there. And we'll show this when Jonathan gets up. And then the fourth step is create policy. I'll show you that in just one second. And finally, we're going to monitor and maintain. We're going to take all the telemetry from this and re-inject it back into the system. And so what we can do is create an anti-fragile system. So if you're familiar with the concept of anti-fragility from uh, Nissim Nicholas Taleb, Taleb uh, uh, who wrote the book Anti-Fragile, he gave me the vocabulary to talk about what I wanted to build, a system that gets stronger and stronger under load. So your human body is an anti-fragile system, right? Uh, I'm going to go home. I've been having a lot of gummy, gummy worms at the hotel and things. I'm going to have to get anti-fragile and get back to working out. And, and I, by stressing my body, it makes it stronger, right? That's what we're doing. And then finally, here we have the, um, 
uh, we have the policy statement. So this is called the Kipling Method. So who, what, when, where, why, and how. Uh, Rudyard Kipling gave this to us in a poem in 1902. So we can create policies, whether we're going to the cloud or on-premise. You can build this out, Jonathan, uh, where we can look at who has access via what application, where is that located, and how should we look at the packet in order to make an allow statement? So zero trust is a set of granular allow rules. You notice there's also some time limitations, when and why. Those are kind of there for later on when you get more advanced, but you need to know who should have access via what application, where is that located, and then how should you inspect that? And if that if, if all of those things meet a certain criteria, then you will allow it. Zero trust is a set of granular allow rules. And this is important because policy is binary. All you can do is allow or deny. You can have multiple different sets of criteria to make the, the allow rule, but all bad things happen inside of an allow rule. So if you're spending very much time looking at, oh, we denied something. Let's do an investigation of what we denied. No, you just need to, hey, high five the team. Hey, we, we, we denied that. Go, let's move on. Let's look at what we're allowing. Because everything that's bad happens inside of an allow rule. So if there is a data breach at your organization, you are a co-participant in it because there was a policy that allowed it to happen. That's, that's a hard thing to tell people, right? You, you know, and, and it's not purposeful, but it's, it's the old model rearing its ugly head. Okay. So now I'm going to turn it over to Jonathan. He's going to talk about how you can build this out in Google Cloud. And uh, thanks. OK, so the, the first thing I want to uh, uh, talk about here is, is that um, uh, when, I, when I started my Zero Trust journey about 2016, um, there was already a number of vendors out on the market uh, coming to us. Uh, you know, at that time, I was one of the big major global consultancies like John was at Forrester as at HCL. And and uh, you had all these vendors who wanted to sell you their 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 magic pixie dust for uh, for zero trust. It was just beginning to become a popular topic at that point, and so I I began to wade into it because I was I was working in all three clouds at that point. I had I had big corporate vend uh, customers that were looking for solutions in this front, and it was confusing as hell. I couldn't make heads or tails of any of it. All of the vendors had different definitions for all of the different components of Zero Trust and what was, what was needed for inputs. None of them could give me a transition state for my architectures. None of them could talk to me about what the fundamentals were and how I had to adapt the business of IT in my organizations to meet the requirements of Zero Trust. So I went all the way back to the very beginning, 2008, 2009, started reading John's original work. And that's kind of how we met, is, it, is that I went back to John's work and I started talking kind of publicly to, to CISOs and other people like that about how Zero Trust had kind of devolved into this, into this train wreck of marketing babble that had no relationship to the original principal tenets of Zero Trust that were articulated in John's work at Forrester. And so, I, I was advocating at that point for people to begin to go back to the original documents. What is it? Zero trust is this, this simple principle of eliminating trust from digital systems. So um, at that point, I began working with Cloud Security Alliance, helping to guide the authorship of these, of these documents that, that we use for guidance in establishing these. And over the course of the last two years, I've been privileged enough to work with Hani Rueda here, uh, Rueda here at uh, Google in helping the United States Air Force to develop the first prototype zero trust environments for the research environments um, at Ray Patterson Air Force Base. We support 14,000 researchers across 22 different technical directorates and um, we do a lot of that initial work where there's industry collaboration and academic collaboration with the researchers inside the lab in Google Cloud. Um, one of the reasons for that is because it's very difficult to get a professor at a university a cat card in, in a week so that they can collaborate with the materials directorate on some new science project that they're working on. So um, with that said, I wanted to outline what, what it is that makes a, a basic zero trust architecture and how we do that in Google Cloud Platform. So next slide. Uh, the first thing, as John said, is we have to go to step one. What's the first, what's, what is it that we're protecting? So 
if you're going to build even the most basic, simple web application, a secure web application that only your users are going to have access to, the first thing that we need to understand is what, what, what are the DAS elements that compose that application. We've got a front-end service, we've got a back-end service, and then we've got the application data, which may live in, say, a managed SQL instance. Next slide. We then define the protect surfaces. So each of those, each of the protect surfaces needs a network to be isolated, to be micro-segmented from each of its other counterparts. Um, so we identify protect surfaces for the front-end service, the back-end service, and the application data. We then uh, map the, that to ingress control. Next slide. And then we begin to map the transaction flows. So we have the external users outside on public networks. They hit some form of ingress control, which in this case would be a load balancer. They hit the front end subnetwork, which hosts the front end services, say uh, a Go application, uh, 12 lines of Go running Caddy 2 that talks to some JavaScript sitting in a GCS bucket. And then that will then make API calls to a backend service, which will then communicate with your, your application data in a Cloud SQL instance. Next slide. We then begin to align policy enforcement points to the protect surfaces. Now, this is the, this is the part that's really, really important to, to understand. Once we've identified each of the individual protect surfaces, the protect surfaces that map to each individual DAS element, you need to have a policy enforcement point to effectively enforce policy within within the environment. So, in these cases, we have firewall rules that are that are that are governing uh, the passing of traffic. You know, using gRPC on TCP uh, 50051 and the uh, uh, the back ends communications with the database on uh, port 5432. We're also uh, uh, requiring uh, TCP 443 for ingress control, so all of it has to be um, over TLS. Next slide. The next thing that we do is we bring identity to the perimeter here. This is where we restrict access for unauthenticated users. This is one of the main advantages of working in Google Cloud. Um, Google Cloud has this concept of identity-aware proxy. It's um, uh, uh, when you hit the load balancer, the load balancer is actually two components, a front end component and a back end component. And when you hit the front end, it then goes to a sidecar proxy and says, are these packets authenticated? Is this request authenticated? Do I know who this user is? If not, it immediately sends you to a login screen and says, identify yourself, authenticate yourself. Should I put your packets on my network? And only when that's happened, do the packets get signed and that's a very, very important concept. The packets themselves get signed, and then the traffic gets connected to the back end, which then passes it through the firewall to your VPC, which contains the subnetwork for your front end service. So that, that right there, in and of itself, is, is a perfect example of how you protect a single protect service. And can you just tell everybody how the packets get signed? With a token, I mean, yeah, because yeah, signing means different things to different people. So. I am going to hand that to Honey because. Thank you. Well, just a regular good old digital signature. Somebody using their private key that only Google has access to. They sign it, and then the recipient will make sure that hey, not only we want to authenticate you and authorize you, but we want to make sure which door you passed through before you got to us, because some people might want to evade it and go directly without passing through this door. So digitally sign, digitally verify. If it passes, you go through authorization, hopefully at layer seven. Exactly. And then on the web front end, typically what we, we will do in, internally is that we'll also have a SAML integration on the front end that so as, as those packets come in, um, that's what authorizes the user to, to access the front end service. Um, I can get into all of the uh, nuance of the service accounts and the way that we authorize the front end to talk to the back end and the way that we authorize the back end to communicate with the managed SQL uh, instance, but there'll be a, this this will all be up on slides and in the speaker notes, we're running out of time here, but in the speaker notes, there'll be some more details about that. Um, next slide. Um, the next thing that we have to do is that we have to have a role binding 
for the users that you want to be able to access this application. That IAP web app user role is then bound at the project level for, for this application, and that is what gives the IAP service the signal to allow their packets onto the back end of the network. So in the final slide here in this sequence, and this is basically what the complete basic architecture looks like. You've got a web application with ingress control uh, that is identity aware, passing packets back to a subnetwork on which the front end service live, which then can commu communicate with the back end subnetwork and the back end service which then has access by a dedicated service account to um, the application data in Cloud SQL, which itself lives on its own network. Each of them, uh, each service, front end, back end, and uh, the, the SQL uh, workloads all on their own subnetworks, all of them individually firewalled from each other, and each of them individually permissioned using dedicated service accounts. So, uh, and then fourth, all of this, we generally accomplish using infrastructure's code. So this is, uh, this is, this is the project code. It's very simple. Um, I will say this. Um, we all work in government. Um, our, we are obligated not only to deploy things safely and securely, but, but to also maintain them in a secure state. If you don't have state, you don't know what you have. And so I'm going to uh, point this out, that if, if you're thinking about going forward on this zero trust journey, one of the first things that you need to do, do is understand how you're going to know what it is that you have long term and ensuring that it is in the, the state that you initially configured it in, that you can, you can continuously ask novel questions of your infrastructure and get answers back that confirm its configuration is as you intend it to be. So that means adopting Terraform, adopting things, tools like Argo at the application layer so that you have declarative means by which to confirm that your infrastructure as, 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 as you intended it to be. Um, next slide. Um, and I'm gonna pass this back to John here because this is where it gets really interesting. This is where we begin to apply policy at layer seven, which is where we integrate an, an IDS service. And with that, I'll pass it on to John. Yeah, the, the key thing here about layer seven, again, it's where the attackers are, right? So if, if all I'm relying on is the access policy at the identity level, uh, then a malicious user, Snowden, Manning, uh, uh, this uh, Texaria, the new, the new guy, uh, they can still do bad things. And so we need to be looking at those packets. And in Google, they have Google IDS, which is really an IPS. So IDS is, is unidirectional without state. IPS, the better term, is when it's bidirectional, contains state, and looks at the full packet up through layer seven, and then can block the bad things. So you want to block bad things. You don't want to allow them and then investigate them later. Don't worry about false positives. They don't happen very much anymore. Occasionally, we'll see a false positive, but it's really rare because the technology is so good and understands what's happening uh, at the packet layer so well that we don't have the problems that we had uh, at the end of the 20th century, the beginning of the 21st century, where everything was a false positive. I used to joke that every SOC engineer was colorblind because you got so tired of chasing your tail with the red alerts that they just became green and you quit looking at them. Well, the world has changed. So, so use those layer seven controls as much as you can. And it's going to be dependent. If you're in Google Cloud here, you're going to be limited to the things that can be deployed in Google Cloud. But there's a whole ton of things that you can do. And so uh, go ahead and, and work on that. And so uh, finally, it, once you understand that process, let's get fancy. Here's a very sophisticated one that's done in GCP. Um, maybe I can let Hani, who, who built this, uh, talk about that. Sure. Thank you, John. Working? Hello? Yeah. So this is just uh, a fancy diagram for a real-life example of how things work. Uh, again, we can think about it as protecting uh, uh, a multi-tier application, front-end, back-end, and a database. We use multiple components, and we start you know, from the bottom where we go. We have the GFE. This is where we have some protections, like VDOS protections and whatnot. But then after we get there, we go into the load balancer, and the best part about this is anything 
that can be a backend service to an external load balancer can be protected using zero trust. And that's a big statement. This can be something running on premises or something on cloud GCP or something on another cloud. And that's how we use those con connectors and uh, other services that will allow you to sort of, even if you have something with a private IP on premise, it will consider it a back end for this load balancer, which is when this IAP will be checking for context awareness. And you don't want to check only for identity attributes. You want to check for operating system. Is the device protected? Is it, does it have an uh, encrypted disk on it? Is, is uh, the patch level the one that you want it? So there is so much more than just identity that you can check in here. And once you're able to authorize and authenticate, all well, again, at layer seven, you go into the multitude of controls that can happen from the org policies on top. And we have this hierarchy of hereditary policies that go from the organization to the folder, to the project, down to the resources. So you're hitting things from an org level, Next, you go to the VPC, that's another isolation layer. Then into the subnets, again, you're isolating more and more. And you have those firewall rules, stateful, and everything else that you generically get from any other cloud vendor. So this is pretty powerful because it's allowing you to literally zero trust any application, whether it's SAML-based, even if it's a legacy-based app. And then the, the, the last thing we want to touch on, and, and again, this is a little too short of a talk to get into things like context-based access control and, and, and VPC service controls, but one of the key things that I like to tell, especially my command leadership, is that zero trust is, is a business enabler. This is not something that is going to uh, constrain your users. Um, when you enforce policy higher up the stack, you have to deny more frequently. You have, to, I am protecting a multitude of things under a policy enforcement point if it's close to my ingress control. But if I, if I shift the policy enforcement down the stack to the things that I'm trying to protect, I have more information, I have more context about that request to be able to say yes. And so when implemented correctly and when, apply, when the policies are applied correctly, what you're actually able to do with zero trust is say yes to user requests more frequently, and that removes friction from your production environments for the, for the end users, and it makes everybody inside your 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 ecosystem more productive. So, um, with that, uh, I think we love to take questions. We, anybody in the audience has questions, and uh, and thank you very much for joining us. Um, in that previous diagram, you had an endpoint SDK uh, that was looking at the was was that a client running on the device? Um, so how are you how are you applying policy? Is it just at the TCP/IP layer, or are you able are you running a client on the device? So uh, in in our case at the lab, we use Google Chrome generally as the client for all of our web facing applications, and we use managed uh, we use managed Chrome profiles. So with the managed Chrome po profile and and the context based access tools like uh, uh, Access Context Manager, we have the ability to determine at, at the t at the time the request is being made whether a user has. Um, is on a managed device if they have uh, you know full disk full device encryption enabled um, uh, if they're logged in with their CAC card there's a number of, of important signals and so when you take a look at the uh, you know, oh, this one when you start taking a look at Kipling method policy uh, you, you see it as a, as a, 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 a six dimension matrix right and so at, at one end of the matrix in each, in each dimension, you're going to have this signal, and you can accept signals of varying strength. Like, if you're running a web application and it, that's, that's publicly acceptable, your identity signal may, may be completely acceptable, but it's very weak, right? Are you, but, sorry, are you decrypting SSL in browser? Are you no. decrypting SSL in browser is the question. No, the, the, uh, the SSL termination point is always the load balancer. So t like TLS to the LB. Um, so once you go through Google's front end, 
that those packets are passed to the the front end of the load balancer, and then and then IP, and then they're decrypted on the back end when they pass the unencrypted traffic. Well, it's not unencrypted in Google. That's the other thing. Is it's actually it's going over uh, uh, MacSec at that point because they're encrypting point to point hardware between the devices. So. Is it's kind of like a more about design application with the zero trust in mind because typically <laughs> when we people are talking about zero trust it's about the networking layer mm -hmm. but it is requiring application support as well because we have to really tell the people we need to think about application also supporting zero trust if the application is supporting some signature mechanisms your networking will be limited again so we have we have situations inside the lab where we have hardware that predates most modern controls, right? That run on operating systems that would like curl the shorts of most IT administrators today. And, but we, we need them. Like the, those, those, those devices are no longer made. They're, 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 they're critical for, for some kind of research. Some of our electron microscopes are like that. Um, there are there are hardware solutions that address some of those that allow us to secure those applications in those cases, particularly on-prem. On, on um, I also uh, believe that things like VPC service controls, the fact that we sign the packets in ingress um, through with IAP allows us to do some very unique things uh, within within a service mesh. So if you're running like yeah, Kubernetes- Yeah, that's another architecture like, stuff. If you go to service yeah. mesh and sidecar proxies and stuff, it's really application should support architecture. Yeah, so you, right. you're then deploying, you, you're going to, but then you're offloading, say, the validation of the signed packets to the service mesh and then passing that down into, say, your, 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 your network in Kubernetes, right? Yeah. So um, I don't think that, I'll, I'll actually let John, ask, do you? Well, so, you know, best case scenario, you want the application to be aware of what's going on, but the reality is there's a disconnect between security, networking, infrastructure and the people who develop applications, right? Thank you. That's right. what I was <laughs> looking yeah. for the year. And so the people who develop applications are, have a di different set of incentives. They want to push, you know, updates as fast as they can, right? I talk, they're the Ricky Bobbies of IT. They want to just go fast, right? That's right. And so <laughs> in general, they're, and we did this research at Forrester, they don't really care about security. So we're going to, uh, okay, you don't care about security, we're gonna make your application secure even though you're not making the application secure. And quite frankly, it's impossible. You can't get rid of all the vulnerabilities because you're doing your best job you can and then five years later, somebody finds Log4j, right? And no one built Log4j to be vulnerable, but it just turned out that times change, things change. And so, yeah, uh, so yes. Does that make answer yeah, your exactly. question? Exactly. So second assumption is like when you look at the asset, especially on the screen, you think about the role-based access control is outdated and we have to do asset-based, asset-based centric. No, no, well, we're gonna contact. do both role-based and attribute-based and all kinds of access control based upon multiple sets of signals, right? So uh, I want to just ask the question, who, who or what should have access to the resource? And, and why is that happening, and how should that be allowed, right? So sometimes role is still the best way, especially if I haven't got more advanced identity systems and I'm struggling to just, this group in Active Directory needs to get access to this resource. That may be all I can do. And then I'm gonna add all, multiple layers on top of it to enforce that. But it, yeah. again, depends on what data we are protecting. It absolutely does right. pretend, protect on, depend on what data you're protecting. The problem is where, you know, most organizations can't get to perfection. There's something keeping them from it. And so sometimes they're afraid to just start the process because they can't do it perfectly. And I say, wherever you are is the proper place to start. Just do it now. Panic. Start panicking now. Do something, and that will begin your journey, right? So the journey of 1,000 miles begins with the first step. Make that first step. Right? Don't don't worry about the things that don't work so well because you'll find a way to get around that. It, you'll, it, it allows you to be creative. Yeah, a perfect example is uh, we we had a we had a, a workload uh, in the lab for the the cloud architects were using uh, Jira, um, and and let's just say that Atlassian's deployment model is not ideal, and and so 
we had to do our best with that workload. So it needed to be, to be deployed, um, you know, above above FedRAMP high uh, for this environment. It didn't touch CUI data or anything sensitive, but we still needed to to, to get controls around it. So. The first thing that we did is we took the standard the standard deployment and we kind of decoupled all of the critical components of it. The stateful parts of it that needed disk were, were put into cloud cloud uh, cloud native storage. Um, the the next part of it was the the decoupling of the database and 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 then and then the server portion. And so we built that with Packer. We had something that was that was in a known state when it was deployed. We attached the cloud resources to it. And then we secured it using this approach. So, thank you. Thanks. So we're out of time. Thank you very much for coming. We really, really, really appreciate it, and uh, we hope we can engage deeper with you later on. Okay.